Sweet and moaning Oh Lord It's sweet and moaning Sweet and moaning Sweet and moaning Reverend Rutland, uh, you described the time leading up to uh, some of the racial con confrontation in the city of Birmingham as a lonely time prior to that, a time when you had to say things that was on your conscience. Why did you call it a lonely time? Well, of course, uh, when people realized that I was taking the stand I was taking, even my bishop and the other leaders of the conference were afraid. I don't know if you were living in those days. I certainly Birmingham. was, yes. Well, it was a very difficult thing to stand up for anything that would be in black and white together uh, because uh, the politics and the social ideas of the people in Birmingham were so much opposed to that. And anyone who would stand and say, we need to bring blacks and whites together on an equal basis, we're in trouble. So when I would uh, do things and the bishop would call me in and say, you don't need to do those things, you'd be... You need to calm down. You're making your people angry. Uh, of course, instead of having a bunch of friends around me, then I had people who, at best, were distant and did not give me the comfort. Of course, if I had, I had a good wife that stayed with me and, and comforted me, and there were always a few people, a few lay people, and very few ministers that stood with me. Why do you think you were able to do that? I mean, what was it that compelled you to do this when other ministers didn't? My mother, uh, I was brought up to believe that people were people and that uh, all people were God's children and that every person was just as worthy as every other person. And when I saw during my early ministry in places in Pickens County and even in Walker County and some of my smaller churches, when I saw how people were treating black people, and yet calling themselves, and in every other area of their lives, they probably were fine Christian people. Well, it just kind of stirred something within me, and I felt that somebody had to say something, and I felt like I was that one to say it. Why were you not uh, told to be quiet and or else leave the church? Why were you not, uh, Robert Hughes, for example, was, I mean, had to leave the church? Well, of course, that's a matter of opinion, whether whether... And Bob had to leave or not. Uh, you know, you, you can face these things and say it's just too tough and I'm going to leave. The bishop's saying you got to do this, you got to do that, and you don't want to do it, so you leave. I didn't want to leave. And when the bishop called me in and asked me to be quiet, and he'd say, you don't need to be saying these things. One of the funniest things I ever remember is, that Bishop Hodge called me in one time, and he had some bulletins that I had printed where I had said some pretty straightforward, truthful things about race relations. And he uh, looked at those bulletins, and he said, John, for goodness sake, say what you want to from the pulpit, because you can deny that or say they misunderstood it. But quit putting these things in your bulletin because they're there, and they can't, you can't change them after they're there. And then he said, why do you do this anyhow? And I said, it isn't the question, Bishop. The question is, why don't you do this? This is what our church says. This is what the New Testament says. And we need a leader who will say that, Bishop. You're the one who needs to be saying what I am saying. And his response was? Well, he said, you know, one day, this makes a method preacher feel real good. He said, you know, John, you would like to leave Woodlawn which I don't worry about that idea. But you would like to leave Woodlawn, and the people would like for you to leave, but where on earth could I find a church that would take you? Now that makes you feel good. <laughs> <laughs> one of the most uh, quoted things by everybody that you said one day was, in a, I believe in a sermon, when you said, if Jesus were to come back today, he would not be welcome 
in the Christian church. He yeah. would be more welcome as a Jew in the yeah. temple. Right. Elaborate on that. Yes. I, well, I just said, you know, preaching on a sermon, I, uh, I use the fact that uh, if, uh, if Jesus were to come, he would not come in a big Cadillac. Uh, he would not come in a, a big uh, sports car. Uh, he'd probably come on a donkey. And if he tried to get in this church, you wouldn't let him in. Especially you wouldn't let him in if you pushed back his beard and saw that this, the skin under it was black. And I said, the Jewish church would receive him, but we wouldn't receive him. What was the response of the country? Oh, it was terrible. What did they do? <laughs> oh, they just didn't do much except call me in. You know, I had, uh, I answered my phone so many times. This is while I was at Woodlawn. I answered the phone so many times and people would call me a son of a bitch. I'd pick up the phone and say, you son of a bitch. I heard that so much until I really thought my name was son of a bitch. <laughs> How did you respond to that? Did you, was your life ever threatened? Oh, yes. But I never took it seriously. I didn't think this. They, when they burned the cross, I, they promised to come back and bomb my house and all that kind of stuff. You want a story about that? I do, indeed. Uh, you know, Bob Lindbergh, was also a member of our church. The ch police chief yeah. at that Mr. Time. Connor would be elected one time and Mr. Lindbergh, Lindbergh the next. Well, then both of them, by the way, that's Bull Connor and Robert Lindbergh, both yeah. police commissioners at some time for the Yes, record. and both of them were in our church. Well, we got so many threats one day until we just thought this might be, might be for real. They're going to bomb our house tonight. We put the children in the back room, and Mary and I went out and sat on the front porch, uh, and really behind the hedges, kind of, and we sang How Firm a Foundation. And you sang How Firm a Foundation. With each other, we sang, and we prayed, and we waited, and in a few minutes, a car came by. We lived on a corner. It came by and went slowly around that corner. Now, looking back on it, if we'd had any judgment, we would know, would have known that if that car was going, the people in that car were going to do anything to us, that they would have done it. They wouldn't have driven around two or three times. But on about the third time, it came around real slowly. Mary said she had to go in the house for a moment, and she went in and called Bob Lindbergh. It must have been one or two o'clock in the morning, one o'clock in the end. And she talked to him and said, Mr. Lindbergh, we're scared. There's a car going around. And he said, is it a... Uh, described the car, and Mary said, yes, I think that's right. I said, well, does it have a 54 tag on it? She said, yes, I think it does. As a matter of fact, that's Pickens County, and that's where we served one time. He said, well, you go to bed and forget it. I said, that's, that's my men. I said, uh, I have people guarding your house 24 hours a day. Didn't you know that? Did you have the same kind of protection when Bull Connor was police chief? No, no. No, no. Why not? I don't know. He just didn't think I was in danger. And that didn't give me a lot of comfort. As a matter of fact, it made me feel a little worse because I said, hey, if they think it's that dangerous, there must be something to it. I don't believe anybody ever intended to bomb our house. I really don't. But they told us that, and we could, you can never be sure, you know. Because at the time, the fear was so over-pervasive yeah, uh, all, right. all around, if you dare stand up at any time. Let's uh, look a little bit at, at uh, what happened in 1961, because that turned the tide. By this time, Lindbergh is out. Bull Connor is in. He is coming to your church every Sunday. Mm -hmm. And where was he that famous Mother's Day when uh, all of the uh, buses... Uh, he called me earlier that morning, and... Uh, he said, Preacher, do you know what time that these people are coming in? And I said, Mr. Connor, if I knew, I wouldn't tell you. And I was honest. I did not know what time. He thought I was con connected with them, which I was not. Uh, not before, anyhow. After some of them got beat up and so forth, I tried to minister to them. But, but at that time, I was not, uh, uh, I was not in, in the know. I mean, I was not one of the leaders that brought them in. So I didn't know when I said, Mr. Connor, I don't know when they're coming. But if I did, uh, I wouldn't tell you. But I said, listen, uh, I want to see you just for a few minutes sometime. And he said, all right. And I went down to see him. This is on Sunday, if you remember. You went down to the police yes. station. And, uh, and I begged him. I said, Mr. Connor, I know what you're going to do. You say you're going to protect them. I know better than that. You know better than that, too. And I begged him, please to give protection and not what he gave, I didn't get anywhere. What, 
was there not a, a dichotomy here between Bull Connor coming to church every Sunday and yet not listening to you, his pastor, not opening his heart in any way, shape? Was that frustration to you? He didn't bother me as much as it did him, I guess. Uh, my favorite story about him, and my wife would certainly want me to tell this story because it's do. her favorite story. One Sunday morning, I went down, and Mr. Connor and two other people were standing just like that in front of my <laughs> church. And I walked up, I said, I never called him Mr. Connor, I always called him Bull. But on this day, I said, Mr. Connor, what are you doing here? I'm going to use a word I don't ever use. He said, I'm not going to let any niggers come in my church. I said, oh, Mr. Connor, you've got it all mixed up. This is not your church. This church, it belongs to the North Alabama Conference of the United Methodist Church. And I am the trustee who is in charge of this church. And I will decide who goes into the church, not you. That's my decision. Now, I'm going around here and call Mel Bailey. And I'm going to come back here in five minutes and if you're still standing here, Mr. Bailey is going to come out here, and I'll swear out a warrant for you, Mr. Connor. Remember, he was police commissioner. I said, I'll swear out a warrant for you and have you arrested for trespassing. <laughs> but when I turned the corner, he said, come on, fellas, that son of a bitch will do what he says. <laughs> <laughs> Did you call him? Because he left. He didn't have, but he didn't come into the church to pray. He didn't come into the church to take part of the... Uh, oh, he came to worship services all the time. Uh, once a month or so, he'd jump up and say, I'm not going to listen to anything like that and walk out. You mean he disrupt the service? Oh, yeah. Well, he was just running for office. That's all he was doing. Uh, Bull Connor was not uh, vicious with uh, white people, at least. He was not vicious with me. He gave us a good Christmas present every year. What did he give you? <laughs> well, one time he gave me a great big bo box of cookies, and I told me I was afraid to eat them. <laughs> You said you ministered to uh, the, the, the people on the bus that, that came, came down. Yes. There were many, many uh, Christian uh, activists that yes. came into Alabama on yes. that famous yeah. Mother's Day. Yeah. And they were brutally, yeah. brutally uh, yeah. treated and burned. Yeah. When you say that, did that sort of act as a change in your life in any way, shape, or form? I doubt it because I was already under the gun so much, you know, when you've had a cross burn in the yard and you get threats like we've been getting them, uh, nobody ever hit me. Uh, and uh, when you have tried to work with uh, people to bring about uh, an end to the boycott that they were having, all that kind of stuff, I've been so involved with that until, uh, I have to admit, I was surprised. I didn't think Mr. Connor would, and I doubt if he meant for it to turn out as bad as it did. I think it's just like letting a snowball start down a Hill and just picked up and picked up and people who were involved just just did worse than he thought they would. Do you really do you really believe that? Yes, I do. Even though he took a very arrogant yeah. stand afterwards. And, and well, you know, you know what he was doing was running for office, and we've got to remember that the and I don't know how much better we are today. I think we're some better, but the community today uh, is still very very uh, determined to keep things as they are. Status quo people. And if you're going to run for an office, you've got to pretend at least that that's what you are. And you're saying it's all politics. Then. I think with Bull Connor it was, yes. And you're saying today this is true? You still see racism sure, here we're talking sure, now I think in 95. You've got to, you've got, that's the reason, that, ooh, I'd like, like to say something you don't want me to say, I guess. What? I said that's the reason the Republicans got elected. It's because the Republican Party stands, whether it's right or wrong, in the minds of so many people. It stands for white supremacy. And you think that's why it's taken over? In other words, nothing has changed in Alabama. Well, I think a lot of things have changed. I think some of the leaders of the, in our, in our uh, uh, offices in, in Birmingham and throughout the, the conference, I think uh, throughout the state, I think we have some people who are not like that. But I think if you're going to run for office in Jefferson County particularly, uh, if you want to be elected, you better take a stand that we're going to keep blacks over there and whites over here. What can we do, do you think, in your view now, as you look back, to, to possibly change this? Uh, that's a difficult question. Every individual must do what every individual can do. And not be afraid to speak out. Yeah. Uh, every, every other week I meet with a group of black people 
over across town on uh, 10th Avenue and 30th Street. It was, we moved down to 41st Street now. And I may just moved in a home over there with, with people, every one of them are fine people. Although they were, many of them, when we started this little group, were very much t- uh, involved with drugs and alcohol. But then many of them, most of them now have come to know a better way of life. And I do that. That, that That's about 30 people maybe that I'm trying to touch. But uh, I can't touch 3,000 people. And I can't touch them. Uh, let, let me go back to that. Uh, they were just uh, asked me to move back. Um, they let, let's go back to that time you, leading up to 1961 and and the actions that that were were there followed thereafter. What did this do to your children growing up in an environment like that? Uh, they 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 saw the cross being burned. Was the cross burned at your house or the church? By the way, house at the house. We were out of town. They didn't see it being burned. Most people who burn crosses don't do it when people are at home. Um, well, my son is a minister of a Epworth Methodist Church in, in Huntsville, and he's as strong for civil rights as I am. My daughter is a teacher in Hazel Green Church, Hazel Green School, and a leader in the church in Hazel Green, which is out from Huntsville. And if anything, she's stronger than my son or me. So evidently it didn't uh, drive them in the wrong way. So what do you uh, see happened? There, there came a time of almost peace in Birmingham, if you could say that. After uh, 1963, going up to 66, up to 69, there was kind of a, a movement uh, by people speaking out, coming out, saying maybe we should have better race relations. Mm-hmm. Now you're saying it has turned back. You're saying the clock has turned back. No, I didn't say that. Uh, because I'm not involved enough. No, you need to ask David Van that question, or or Chuck Morgan, or or some of the people who are still involved in the the civil rights movement. I I have uh, not because I don't want to be involved, but just because of my age and because of other opportunities. Then I've been out of Birmingham too. Uh, but I would say, as far as I know, there are no uh, church organizations especially no ministers' organizations that are working for better relationships. Now, there may be some organizations I don't know about, but the ones I know of, there was a time when we had greater Birmingham uh, ministers meeting, and we'd go in and have all kinds of arguments and, and, and discuss this thing, and get mad at each other, and then pray and get in good humor and go home. Uh, and I believe that had something to do with the way that the, the things in Birmingham came. But don't give us preachers any credit much for what happened. You give that to David Van and and um, Arthur Shores. Uh, you remember him? I do indeed. Arthur Shores and people of that sort who were lay people who were really trying to do something where it was hard to get something done. See, we always hid by, we were always hiding behind uh, the church. Nobody's going to come through the church and get you, you know. Uh, I know that uh, Bob Hughes really got into difficulty because he refused to give uh, the powers that were. Uh, he, he refused to give the copy of, a, of the, the names of the people who were in that organization. Alabama uh, Council on Human Relations, yes. right. Uh, and Bob was real strong on that. And I, I admire him for it. When he was in jail out in Bessemer, I called our bishop and I said, you got a preacher in jail, bishop. Let's go see him. And the bishop said, I'm real busy. How about you going? And no, he said, you go get the di- call the district superintendent. I called the district superintendent. And I said, listen, I'm going out to see Bob. You want to go with me? No, no, he said, I've got something else to do. Uh, so Frank Dawson, who was our youth director, and I went out to see Bob Hughes. I'm trying to think of the of the DA out there at, Hunts- at Bessemer at that time, Sullins, I believe. And then we went by to see him, and he came, he took us out there and when we, first, they wouldn't let us see him. We went to go and see him, and they took us by to see him. And we, we were instrumental, I hope, in getting Bob out of jail that day. But Bob Hughes was a brave man, and he stood for what he thought was right. Now, I don't think that kind of thing would happen today. In other words, you don't see a Methodist minister or a minister yeah. being put in jail. No, I can't believe that. But uh, you, you instead see a climate of racism, you're saying. 
Yes, I guess it's a, it, it isn't the vicious racism. I mean by that it isn't the physical, we're going to hit somebody on the head kind. Or we're going to, we're going to see to it that people don't do these bad things or, or people don't come into our place. But it's kind of a subtle sort of thing, you know, that uh, when a person comes to our church, for instance, when a black person comes to our church, Nobody gets up and says, hey, you can't come in here, you know, you know, like that. But they freeze them out. They just, uh, I don't mean just my particular church, but I, I, this, I think, is what happened in all white churches in time. Let's go back again uh, to, to your upbringing, if we can, uh, uh, Pastor. I, I, I think that I would like to find out, you said it was your mother, primarily, mm -hmm. that did this. What about your father? You grew my, up in a segregated environment. My father died when I was nine years old. We were in the worst segregated county, I guess, in Alabama, the free state of Winston. I was at Haleyville, Alabama. You say that's, that was more segregated than other places? Well, we just didn't have any black people there at all. So you didn't have to worry about that's it. That's right. We had two, about two black families, and I was friends with both of them because my mother taught me that when somebody is being put down, you get on their side. And that's the way I was taught. So you went to school where? Uh, to college? I went to Birmingham Southern. But you must have stood alone there when you were out there. There, were no, there were no black people in Birmingham Southern. There were no black people, but no. you certainly had to have opinions about race relations in Birmingham. Did you speak out as a student? Well... I can't remember if we were doing a lot of speaking out on that or not. If it, I'm sure that if there came a time that somebody needed to say something about it, I would have, because I was at that time just as strong for uh, the integration of races as I am today. What about when you got your first church? Where was your first church? Well, I had a little country church, a little uh, mining camp churches when I was in college. Uh, and, of course, in those days, uh, the United Mining United Mine Workers was a strong, strong organization of which I was a part. And uh, You were a member of the United Mine Workers? Oh, sure. <laughs> no, I wasn't a member. I was an uh, auxiliary member. In other uh, words, you were a very strong union yeah, man. Yes, right. And, of course, I think United Mine Workers did as much as anybody to bring black and white together. Because when they got a raise for the white folk, they got a raise for the black folk. When they got better living condition for the white folk, they got it for the black folk. Uh, unfortunately, and I don't know how this happened either, the, the labor unions uh, got big bosses, you know. That's Not right. John L. Lewis, boy, he's great. And so was uh, some other people, Walter Ruther and people like that. But, but Lord, beneath yeah. them, mm -hmm. they got, they got some, some leaders who were just hungry for money. And they just grabbed all the money they could get, and, in my opinion. And, and the... the Labor union lost, in the eyes of the uh, of the people, kind of lost uh, a little bit of of credits there, just a little bit of a belief in them. But uh, and I don't think the labor union is doing much today for race relations. They may be, but I don't know. But the, this was also a town with a lot of racial hate. I mean, you have crack, Hannah. You have things like this happening in the steel mills coming in, strike breaking. Yeah. Where did you stand on that? And did you preach against that? Sure. I was. Uh, well, you say this very matter of factly. There were a lot of uh, a polite uh, churches where pastors did not speak out, Reverend Rutland. Well, well, of course, I, would, I just didn't happen not to be one of them. Uh, no, I, I, I don't count myself as being a, a great hero that stood out here as a one man fighting against the whole world. I don't do that. And I never one time, I guess, thought, hey, I'm going to go down here and say something brave. I never got in trouble in my life intentionally. I would just do what I thought was right. And when I did that thing was right, I didn't, I didn't sit back and say, this is going to get me in trouble. It's just like water running downhill. When something happens, you just do what's right. And then you find out, hey, you're in a in a, a bunch of trouble. They had a little, they had a ride out at uh, Woodon High School when I was there. 
Well, I didn't call and ask Mary what I should do. I didn't even go to the altar and pray and say, God, what you want me to do? I saw those kids walking down there with great big st- uh, banners across there saying, kill the black bastards. And, and I knew that was not right. So what did I do? What did you do? I went out and got a hold of the, some of them were in our church. I'd get a hold of them. i say, hey, man, what's the matter with you? You can't do this. And it, almost to a person, they'd shake their head and act like they'd been in a daze or something. And so by the help of the, some wonderful police and some of our our people, we got the thing broken up before it did too much damage. But I didn't sit down in my office and say, now let me see, if I do this, I'm going to get my head beat in. If I do this, are they going to do that to me? I just said, this is what I've got to do, and I did it. Did you ever fear for was, your life, for your children's <laughs> life, for your wife's life, enough to keep you from taking a stand? I mean, we must remember this was a time of enormous fear. Well, somebody, some people said, you're a very courageous man. That isn't true. I was not courageous. I was scared to death all the time. Uh, yes, I, I thought the night that I told you about a moment ago, uh, until I realized that people don't walk around your, your house three times and then bomb you, they're going to bomb you. This is like a guy, a guy doesn't pull out a gun and say, I'm going to shoot you. If he ever pulls out a gun and say, I'm going to shoot you, forget it. Because he he's, if he's going to shoot you, he'll shoot you and say, hey, I shot you. He's not, <laughs> he's not going to pull out a gun and say, I'm going to shoot you. But anyhow, yes, I was scared that night. I was really afraid. Uh, I really anticipated something bad happening. It didn't happen. But afraid for your children? Did they follow your children to school? Did they do any threats that way? Yeah, they... At least once a week, I would, somebody would call and say, we're going to, well, they said more, they're going to rape my wife more than anything else. And then they say, we know that cute little girl of yours. We know how we can get a hold of her and that kind of thing, you know. Well, of course, I told Bob Lindbergh that, and Bob said he had people following, and so we got along all right. Did your wife ever get afraid? Did she ever say, cut this out, John? I think the time has come not to say. Let's move on. Yeah, she, uh, uh, she never really did have the strong conviction on this that I have. She does now, but she did not have then. And she really wanted me not to be quite so strong. Uh, but you didn't listen to her. Well, <laughs> I tried to persuade her. <laughs> and you uh, think you did? Yeah, well, she stood by me. But... Paul Hamhill says in the book, uh, and I, the, the name has suddenly escaped me now, that uh, they ran you out of the Woodlawn Church. That's You're saying true. it's not true. Let's that correct it true. for the record. That's right. They did not run me out. That, and that's the only thing he said. He said some other things that were incorrect. But uh, that's the one thing that bothered me most because I did not want the people in Woodlawn, the people in that church, to be thought of as people who run me out. Now, don't misunderstand me. There were a lot of people who would like to have run me out. And I guess that's what he meant to say. His daddy was one other. Wanted to run you out. Yeah. And so he heard that kind of thing. But people like Mr. O'Toole and, and Claude Hughes and, and Dr. Farnham and a lot of others that I could mention, uh, the Kirby's, Amos Kirby and that group, they stood by me, although many of them thought I was going too far. And they did not like where I was going. One time, they, uh, Sidney Hill, who, by the way, still is living out in Trinity, and... Uh, and still standing for the right thing. But Sidney Hill was chairman of our administrative board, and they got up and made a motion that we were going to give uh, the Methodist Layman's Union some money. Well, the Methodist Layman's Union was nothing but a white citizen's council in disguise. And so when they got through with that, and he turned around to me and he said, uh, uh, the man man presenting, and he said, now you answer all these things, uh, preacher, and I said, I don't have to answer Mr. His name, I'm, I'll give him another name. Mr. Young, I don't have to answer that. Uh, the only thing I want to say to you, you're no longer on this administrative board. When I knew, I did not have the authority to take anybody off administrative board, but he didn't know that, and I knew he didn't know that. So I just said, you're no longer on this board, and I just left. I said, you folks do what you want to with it. After they stayed in there for five minutes, Sid came by and said, well, we just didn't even discuss it. We just turned it down, and I want five minutes in the service next Sunday. And he got up the next Sunday and read the most beautiful statement about supporting a preacher, whether you agree with him or not. And the whole church stood up and clapped. So uh, 
I had I had support from that church. I also had a lot of people not supporting me. But uh, I didn't leave that church because they ran me off. Then why did you leave the church? Because I'd been there nine years. And uh, we had people who would never come back to that church as long as I was there. Uh, people who, some of them even moved their membership. And I felt like those people who didn't, who didn't get anything from my ministry had suffered long enough. And I thought they ought to get somebody, let them come in and let them come back. And many of them did come back. But did the person who follow you take as strong a stand as oh, you? Oh, no, 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 no. In other words, it was more, more traditional, the standard. Uh, he was way on the other side. He was a right-wing uh, person who, who believed in segregation and was going to keep it that way forever and that kind of thing. And I hated that so bad. But that's the way the Methodist Church is, you know. You send one preacher, does one thing, and others do that. Did, did you ever have any bitterness against the Methodist Church for not standing more behind you and other people that wanted to stand out? You've told me stories about the bishop, some of the cowardice and not going out and seeing Hughes in jail. Well, I mean, there, it is, We can call it cowardice, can we not? Yeah, let us say this, and then I'm going to... Okay, when I was at Woodlawn... The powers that be at Birmingham Southern College called and said they want to give me a doctor's degree. I wouldn't walk across the street for an honorary degree. I really would not. And anybody who's got one, please don't get mad at me about that. <laughs> I, I, but I, I just didn't care too much about it. But uh, they, were in, they were insistent that they were going to give me uh, a degree. And I said, okay. Well, about 10 days before the conference uh, met, I mean, before the uh, graduation came, uh, I got a call from the chairman of, of the board of trustees telling me that they had to change their minds, uh, that uh, there was a man who wanted to give a half a million dollars to college and they would not give it if they gave me that degree. And uh, I said, I don't want the degree, but if I was going to sell my conscience, I'd get more than a half a million dollars for it. And I went to see the man who had promised that, and we had a confrontation in which I told him what I thought, and uh, and I wasn't very nice about it. So I guess I was bitter at that time. I didn't want the degree, but I didn't like to have it turned down. So when Mr. When Dr. Birdie called me in 81, I guess it was, 82, whenever it was, he called and said, won't you do me a big favor? I want you to take a degree. I said, no, I'm not interested. Oh, he said, but but you don't know how it hurt this college when they turned that degree down for you, John, and said, we want you to be one of us, and everybody know that you're one of us. Please give it give consideration. Well, my wife and my son both thought I was egotistical and terrible because I did not uh, give uh, uh, him the permission to give me a degree. So after they beat on me a while and he called back the next morning, I agreed to do it. I said all that to say this, that I didn't get the degree earlier because of my stand on the race relation. I got the degree later because of my stand on the race relation. So do you think the Methodist church or Christian churches are, are coming around in any way? I mean, the Baptists have suddenly gotten together black and white. I will congratulate the Baptist church. I think they're doing a wonderful job. I really do. I think the Methodist Church, who was the leader when I was in this kind of thing, situation, trouble, I think we were the leader then, but I think we have kind of calmed down a little bit. And and uh, I don't think that we have uh, would say we don't want to see blacks and whites together. I think it's just we have decided we want to do some other things, and we just kind of easing up a little bit on our... In those days, when we were... When a few of us were really fighting for, for the unification of blacks and whites, which we've done in the Methodist Church, you know, uh, we just have one conference now for blacks and whites. It took a terrible, terrible battle to get that done. And so now they're all together in, in, in the conference. But I won't say that the, the fellowship is much better. I hope it is, but I wouldn't say it's much better. Thank you very much, Mr. Rutland. Well, thank you for letting me come and do this. And, and let me emphasize the fact that I, I don't think that looking back on this thing, I won't tell you one more thing. Okay. Uh, looking back on this, I don't l look at myself as being anything 
courageous or are more wise or better than other people who are not doing it. One night after the um, cross burning, I went down to our church and I knelt down by at the altar as I did every day or night. And I was praying for for the black people in our community because just a few nights before, I had stopped at a little place on 3rd Avenue South where they had 36 people living with one spigot on out in the yard as all the water they had and one outhouse for these 36 people. And and that's all the of the... Uh, way these people had uh, to use toilet facilities. And I leaned over in my, it was about one o'clock, I'd been to the hospital, and I leaned over against my steering wheel, and I just cried like a baby. And while I was crying there, somebody knocked on the window, and I rolled it down. It was a policeman. And he said, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm a pastor of the church. He went, oh, he said, I know who you are. And he said, don't, uh, don't think you're the only one praying for these people. This was a white policeman. I'm praying for them too. So the next Sunday night, I was down there praying for these black people, and I heard a voice. I don't know if you ever hear a voice or not, but I heard a voice saying, pray for the Ku Klux Klan. I said, not me. <laughs> You're asking the wrong thing. I cannot do that. And the voice said, if you cannot pray for the Ku Klux Klan, you cannot pray for anybody. And so I have prayed for the Ku Klux Klan since then as I pray for my black brothers and sisters. Thank you for letting me do this. Thank you. Sweet and Oh, Lord.